Hi everyone, welcome to this lecture about asymmetric information. This chapter will be broken into two parts. Both are related to asymmetric information, but the information asymmetry will take a different form. This week we are going to go over the case of adverse selection and signaling. And uh, in the next lecture, we will go over the case of moral hazard. First, the usual disclaimer. I do not allow this content to be published without my consent. If I see this content uploaded online, I will take it down and report it whoever uploaded it. Before we get into the actual substance of the lecture, a couple of facts. Used cards, if they are like new, even if they are like new, sell far below their dealership price. That's something we see um, pretty commonly in, um, in modern economies. Laid off workers experience longer spells of unemployment than workers without a job for different reasons. In fact, laid off workers have a harder time to find a job, the harder the unemployment spell. So the longer they are unemployed, the harder it is to find a job. That is actually related to this idea of signaling, showing that if you have been unemployed for a long time, then firms might believe, oh, well, what's up with him? Maybe he uh, maybe he's not employable or something like that. Private health care for the elderly is essentially unavailable. It is very difficult for older people to find health care in the um, in the private system. Corporate rates and group rates for insurance policies are lower than individual rates. That's another common um, common thing we observe. If you are hired by your firm and your firm proposes you some insurance plan or some pension plan, chances are the rates for these plans are lower than if you want to get a plan uh, individually on your own. So what do these empirical regularities have in common? Well, the common thing about these four um, examples is that one side of the contract doesn't have as much information as the other side of the contract. So let me be more specific, but first let me show you the outline for this lecture. First, I will go over the definition of adverse selection. Then I will illustrate this phenomenon in the very first model that was used to study adverse selection, the lemons market. Then after making a summary of the general result, I will go into the case of signaling. And to illustrate this concept, I will look at the first model of signaling, which is education as a signal. In particular, I will talk about two specific types of equilibria, and I will define what I mean by equilibrium in this case. A separating equilibrium and a pooling equilibrium. First, the definition. Adverse selection in economics refers to the outcome of a situation where one or several agents have hidden knowledge about some characteristics that will matter when interacting with other agents. For instance, consumers know privately their willingness to pay for a good, but the firm selling this good doesn't. Individuals who go get insurance know better the probability of them having an accident than the actual insurance company. A freshly employed worker knows if he is highly productive or not, but the employer might not necessarily know this at the time of the hire, etc. I will go over other examples as well a bit later. So the idea is that one side of the contract or the transaction or the market 
has information that the other side doesn't have. And we are going to see how this might lead to a market failure. Agents sometimes have an incentive to keep that information secret. Typically, think about a bad driver who wants to get insurance. If he tells the insurance company he is a bad driver, then the insurance company will charge him a higher insurance premium. Think about somebody selling a bad quality product. He will never tell customers that what he's selling is bad quality. He will say it is good quality even if it's not. Think about somebody who wants to borrow money from a bank, but he's going to spend some of this money at a casino, taking a lot of risks. He's not going to tell his banker that this is how he plans to use his money. Because if, if this is the case, then the bank will charge this borrower a higher interest rate to cover the risk of default. Sometimes, however, agents might want to communicate that information to other agents. For instance, think about a recent graduate from Harvard. He will definitely want employers to know about where he studies. He knows that Harvard is considered as a high-profile school by everybody in the world, so he knows that he has better chances at getting employed and getting a higher wage if he, is men if he mentions he went to Harvard versus if he doesn't mention it. That will be covered in the second part of the lecture, the part about signaling. The information asymmetry can lead to market failures. Trade does not occur or partially occurs. Contracts might not be signed and the outcome might not be Pareto efficient. So how does hidden knowledge lead to adverse selection? So here we are violating the perfect information assumption that we usually make in order to have perfect competition. As I mentioned in the very first lecture about competitive markets, each of these conditions are required for the outcome to be Pareto efficient. If one of them is not, then we have a market failure. Today, we are going to violate the um, perfect information assumption and see what the problem is going to be. To do this, let's go over the first model that looked at this phenomenon, the Lemons Market Model. George Arkeloff in 1970 published a paper about asymmetric information regarding the quality in the market for used cars. So here lemons don't refer to the actual fruit, but they don't refer they do, but they do refer to secondhand cars. Akerlof won the Nobel Prize because of this contribution, along with two other very famous economists that also contributed to the same literature. So the market has two parties. We have a seller S and a buyer B. Both Swiss neutral, that's a detail, you don't need to think about it. So the seller owns a car, which can have two different qualities, each with equal probability. With a probability of 50%, the car can be a peach. This is uh, the term we use to talk about a good condition car, in which case the quality is going to be QH, H for high. Or the car can be a bad condition car, and in this case, we don't call it a peach. You probably guessed it by now. We call it a lemon, or we can also call it a sausage. In this case, the quality of the car is going to be QL, L for low. Now, we need to specify the different preferences of the seller and the buyer regarding each type of car. 
a peach or a good quality car is worth $4,000 to the buyer. So V stands for value, B for buyer, and the value of a buyer for a good quality car is equal to $4,000. This is the maximum amount the buyer is willing to pay for a peach. The seller, on the other hand, is willing to sell the peach for at least $3,000. Note that the maximum willingness to pay of the buyer is higher than the minimum willingness to sell of the seller. So, in principle, nothing will prevent them from making a deal and uh, the, and a peach will be sold. A lemon is a bad quality car, so it is not worth as much money for each party. For a buyer, it's worth $1,000. For a seller, it's worth at least $500. Again, the buyer has a higher willingness to pay than the seller's willingness to sell. So, nothing should prevent them from making a deal and a lemon should also be sold. The efficient allocation is that the car is sold regardless of the quality as buyers are willing to pay more for each type than sellers are willing to sell them for. Why is it efficient? Because right now we can make somebody better off without making somebody worse off. If each car is sold, we can make the buyer better off with a car and the seller better off as well with the money from selling the car. So, regardless of the quality of the car, the baseline is that it is efficient for each car to be sold. Now, in order to look at the consequences of asymmetric information, we need to look at the benchmark. The benchmark says information is perfect. Both the buyer and the seller observe the quality of the car. What is going to happen in this case? Well, since both know the quality of the car, they can simply negotiate a price that is higher than the willingness to sell of the seller and lower than the maximum willingness to pay of the buyer. So, any price between $3,000 and $4,000 is a price that both the buyer and the seller will agree on when the car is a peach. If the car is a lemon, any price between $500 and $1,000 will be a price that is accepted by both parties. In this case, trade is efficient because the car is going to be sold as both parties are willing to trade given the above prices. What is the price going to be for each car? That is um, not very relevant for the model. What matters is that they will find a price that they will agree on. You can use, for instance, cohesion bargaining, but you could use any other sort of bargaining. You could also look at the structure of the market. Is there, are there more um, cars for sale than there are buyers? In which case, the buyers will have more power and they will be willing to maybe buy the car at the minimum price or maybe the other way around. So perfect information is the benchmark. The car is sold regardless of the, of the quality and according to what we saw in the previous slide, it is efficient. Now, let's change the information structure a bit. Before getting to asymmetric information, let's stick to symmetric information, but let's make information imperfect. So in this case, it is symmetric because neither the buyer nor the seller observe the quality of the car. And it's imperfect because they're lacking that information. 
So the seller doesn't even know the quality of the car he's trying to sell. It is not very realistic, but it is just for the sake of the example. So the quality of the car is now as good as random for both parties. And the willingness to sell and to buy cannot depend on quality because none of them know the quality of the car. What are they going to do? In economics, in this case, we use the concept of an expectation, which is the same as an average. When information is not certain, agents use expected, they use an expectation of their utility in order to assess whether they should make a uh, given decision. So, since 50% of the cars are good and 50% of the cars are bad, the willingness to pay, well, the average willingness to pay for a buyer is going to be equal to $2,500. This is equal to half of 4,000 plus half of 1,000. That yields 2,000 plus 500, 2,500. The seller will then be willing to sell his car for $1,750. This number is the average between 3,000 and 500. Half of 3,000 is 1,500. Half of 500 is 250. 1,500 plus 250 yields $1,750. Note that even in the absence of information about the quality of the car, the buyer is willing to pay more than the price the seller is willing to sell the good for. So, they can negotiate a price between $1,750 and $2,500, and both will accept the transaction. Again, regardless of the quality of the car, the car is going to be sold. So, we have a, a case of efficient trade. Any questions before I move on to the more important case? Okay, so let's get into the third case where info information not only is imperfect and also asymmetric. This is also the more realistic case where only the seller, not the buyer, observes the quality of the car. Imagine now that the car is a good car, it's a peach. Well, the seller knows it's a peach, so he's willing to sell a peach for at least $3,000. This is the first condition we need for trade to happen, trade of a peach. Now, the seller knows the quality of the car, but the buyer doesn't. So the buyer is still going to use the expected willingness to pay. In the previous slide, we saw it was equal to $2,500. So a buyer will accept to buy a car if the price is lower than $2,500. Those are the two conditions we need to satisfy in order for trade to happen. But if you look closely, the seller says the price should be at least $3,000 and the buyer says the price should be at most $2,500. Clearly, these two conditions are not compatible. There is no price that the buyer and the seller find mutually acceptable.
So, a peach will not be sold on the market. That is inefficient, as we saw earlier, that a peach and a lemon should be sold for efficiency. So, let's think about what's going to happen. What is the market adjustment and um, where? What is going to happen? So, if the price is higher or equal to $3,000, there is an excess supply. There are many sellers of a peach out there but nobody willing to pay for them because the buyers do not know it's a peach. It could also be a lemon, so they are at most willing to pay $2,500. In order for demand to equal supply, we need prices to fall. However, if the price gets any lower than $3,000, then it means that the seller must own a lemon. We saw that $3,000 is the minimum price a seller will sell his car for. So if the price is a bit lower, if buyers see on the ad a lower price than $3,000, then they conclude, well, that cannot be a peach. It's worth way more to a seller. So that must be a lemon. But if they conclude it's a lemon, then the quality of the car is not uncertain anymore. So they don't need to be willing to pay $2,500. If they see a car sold for less than $3,000, they know it's a lemon. So they are going to be willing to pay $1,000 maximum. Now, owners of lemons are willing to sell their car for $1,000. In fact, they are willing to sell a lemon for at least $500. So, any price between $500 and $1,000 will be mutually acceptable. But, only lemons are going to be sold and peaches are, not no, are no longer on the market. Only lemons are sold, peaches are not. We can say the peach market breaks down. So, let's summarize what's going on. Sellers not finding a buyer will want to lower the price. But if the price falls, especially below $3,000 in this case, High quality sellers will drop out of the market because they are not willing to sell a peach for less than this price and only sellers of lemons are going to be remaining. And this is why we call this phenomenon adverse selection. Only the bad type will be part of a transaction. So only the adverse type will be selected into trade. The average quality deteriorates as the price falls. Imagine you have a, continuous, a continuum of different qualities. As the price falls, well, people who are sellers of good quality cars are going to leave the market because they know they won't find a buyer. And the only ones which are going to remain will be the ones with the lowest qualities. The maximum price buyers are willing to pay falls and price falls further. As the price goes down, buyers realize that those cars cannot be good quality cars. So their willingness to pay goes down. They don't need to include the willingness to pay for peach into their computations anymore. And the market may disappear entirely, in fact. So adverse selection can lead to a total market failure. If trade occurs, it might be less than efficient. And there are other examples of such markets. Think about labor markets. 
credit markets, insurance markets. For instance, for the credit markets, a borrower could be a safe borrower or a risky borrower. A bank will charge a higher interest rate on a risky borrower than on a safe borrower. However, the bank doesn't necessarily know whether the borrower is a risky borrower or a safe one. So it will charge an average interest rate, but that interest rate might be too high for the safe borrower. And if this is the case, then the only people who are going to accept the loan are risky borrowers. Once the bank realizes that, then it will conclude, why do I charge a, an expected interest rate when only the risky borrowers are taking the loan? The bank is going to charge the high interest rate, the one that targets risky borrowers. On labor markets, you can think about a, an applicant that is either high ability or low ability. The employer doesn't know about that. He might propose an average wage. The applicant, if he is a high ability one, might decide to not take that wage. And then the only ones who take the wage will be the low ability applicants and so on. We talked about price discrimination earlier this semester. Consumers have private information on their willingness to pay and perfect price discrimination is not possible. If the monopolist doesn't take incentive constraints into account, only low type bundles are going to be sold. The idea is that when you perform second degree price discrimination, you propose different bundles and consumers will select the bundle they prefer. The firm wants to charge a higher price on customers with a higher willingness to pay. And the problem with this method is that the high willingness to pay customers might actually buy the cheap bundles. So the firm has to make sure that the bundles are designed in the way that a high willingness to pay customer will prefer to pay a high price for, for, for uh, the bundle that targets him as opposed to buy the cheap bundles that targets the consumers with a lower willingness to pay. Similarly, we can find um, adverse selection problems on stock markets, on uh, corporate equity, initial public offer, uh, dating and marriage markets as well, where in each of these um, cases, one side of the market has information that the other side doesn't have, and that might lead only um, bad quality, let's say, agents to take part in a transaction, agents or firms. So in markets with adverse selection, prices are correlated with the source of asymmetry. We saw previously with the market for lemons that the price at the end of the day was between 500 and 1000. Those are the respective willingnesses to pay and sell for lemons. So prices are going to play a dual role. On one hand, they usually they do the usual market cleaning, market clearing, sorry, demand equals supply, but they will also transmit the information to the party that didn't have this information in the first place. When buyers see that the price will be between 500 and 1000, they know it's a lemon. And now everybody has the same information about the quality of the car. Because it's a market failure, there have been multiple institutional and market responses, among which we can find signaling and screening devices, which I'm going to get into in a couple minutes. For instance, warranties. Firms sometimes build reputation through brand names, chains. They can use advertising as a signal, as in 
they spend money in pretty much useless advertising. Sometimes when you go on a highway, you can find those big billboards with advertising. Some of these billboards sometimes do not give you any information about the product of the company that, that has the advertisement. There has been a couple cases, but for instance, uh, there are some billboards which are fully black with just the Nike logo um, in the middle. Not even a slogan, not even the, the picture of a product or anything like this. The idea is Nike, Nike can afford it. Nike offers good quality products. So it's burning money to signal to customers, hey, we are not afraid of spending money because we sell good things. Sometimes firms can ask third party companies like experts to perform some sort of inspection and to maybe um, uh, to maybe provide some uh, standard or some certification as in a third party company can look test the product and give a stamp of approval if the product satisfies satisfies some quality standards. This is the thing, for instance, in the um, refurbished laptops market, at least in Canada. If you look for a refurbished laptop, you will find a bunch of websites. Some of the products have a uh, Microsoft guarantee stamp, some kind of certification that says that Microsoft tried the laptop. It satisfied all the quality standards that Microsoft has. And so Microsoft put a stamp of approval on the product as in it is refurbished, but it is um, satisfying some quality standards. It is a way to signal the quality of the product. Governments also made, men, uh, so made in insurance mandatory. In British Columbia, for instance, health insurance and car insurance are both mandatory. It is illegal to drive a car that is not insured by ICBC. The idea is to avoid this case of having some customers never getting insurance. And by making insurance mandatory for everybody, it doesn't matter whether somebody has information or not. Any questions? Okay. Now, related to asymmetric information, let's talk about signaling. So we saw that asymmetric information can cause market failure. Everybody may be worse off. But those who have superior information about a good may want to convey this information to others. Others, of course, might not want to disclose that information. One of the problems is that the information conveyed must be credible. If the seller of a car tells me it's a good quality car, I have no incentive, I have no reason to believe him. He will never say he's selling a lemon. Of course not. So I cannot trust somebody who just says that what he's selling is good quality because nobody would say that what they sell is bad quality. But agents can use signals, which are noisy informations, noisy as in not necessarily 100% reliable. But these informations are meant to communicate about one's private information. And to illustrate this point, I'm going to talk about the effect of education as a signal. Michael Spence, in 1974, worked on asymmetric information about the ability 
on the job market. So slightly after George Akerlof and continuing this line of work, there has been a lot of um, contributions in this asymmetric information literature. And Michael Spence also won the Nobel Prize uh, in economics in, I believe, 2000 or maybe 2001, alongside George Arkeloff for his work in that particular literature. There was a third laureate that year, that was Joseph Stiglitz, which you might have heard of um, before. The model goes as follows. There are two parties. We have a worker W and we have an employer E. The worker's ability measured by his marginal product is named A and it can be either high or low, both with equal probability, just to make things easy. A high productivity worker is worth AH to an employer. A low productivity worker is worth AL to the employer. We are going to assume that AH is bigger than AL, as in a high productivity worker is more productive than a low productivity worker. The decision problem of the worker is to choose whether to get an education or not. Education here takes the form of a college degree. But we assume that education has no effect on productivity. We assume this because it simplifies the model a lot and the intuition in the result is going to be pretty much the same. So in this model, getting an education just amounts to putting a line on your resume that says you went to that university or you got that degree. That's it. A low ability worker, even with education, stays a low ability worker. Now, obtaining a degree is costly, and this cost is going to vary across ability. If the, ability, if the applicant is a high ability one, the cost of getting a degree will be CH. If it's a low ability one, it's going to be CL. We assume here that a high ability worker is going to experience a lower cost than a low ability worker. A high ability worker is probably naturally smarter or maybe better um, in the academic field. So it will be less painful for him to get a degree than a low ability worker. And here what I call a cost is not just tuition fees. It's tuition fees plus time spent to get the degree in the form in the form of foregone earnings, for instance, or it could also simply be this utility coming from studying. So this is the problem for a worker. The worker knows if he is a high or low ability. And given the cost of getting an education, he needs to think about whether to get an education or not. And he will have in mind the future wage he will be earning with versus without education. Now, I could go through the same process as the market for lemons. But here, I just want to give you the intuition behind what's going on. We are going to distinguish two types of equilibria. In fact, there are more, but those are the main two ones. All the other ones are kind of like a mix of both. There is a bit of both in, in, in um, mixed together. Here, by equilibrium, we do not mean demand equal supply, but we mean that decisions from workers and employers are such that nobody regrets the decision they took. It is also called a Nash equilibrium. It is a game theory concept that you might go through in Econ 302 or in game theory um, lectures. 
This is this idea that once all the decisions are taken and everybody sees what everybody else did, nobody regrets the decision they took. So everybody is maximizing utility seeing what the other ones did. Why two? Well, both are very interesting and relevant. The idea is that those cases are going to be distinguished regarding investing in education or not. So think about workers. Workers are weighing in their options. They can get an education and maybe get a higher wage as a result. But again, I say maybe because it's not guaranteed their wage will be higher. It all depends on what the employer offers. Or they might not get edu any education. So on one hand, they will not have a cost to pay, but they might get paid less. Employers can have beliefs about the ability of a worker with versus without education. The first type of equilibrium I want to talk about is called a separating equilibrium. This corresponds to the case where it is too costly for low ability workers to get education, but not for high ability ones. The idea in this case is that low ability workers prefer not getting an education and maybe get a lower wage. And high ability workers might decide to get education as a result. The idea is that by them getting education and not low ability workers, employers might be able to conclude that anybody with a degree is a high ability worker and anybody without is not. The result is that workers with education will be high ability ones and they get paid a higher wage than low ability workers. Why a higher wage? Because the employer will conclude that they must be high ability workers, so they are worth paying more. If this is the case, then education will be used as a signal for ability and it will help separate types of workers. The ones with education are the, low ability, the high ability ones and the one without education are the low ability ones. It's an equilibrium that where both types are separated by education. Now I mentioned that an equilibrium here is a situation where nobody regrets making their decision. Well, the idea here is that low ability workers definitely do not want to get an education because it is too costly. Now, high ability workers do not need an education, but they are going to get one to signal to the employer that they are high ability workers. And so this way they will signal to the employer that they are good and that they, are, that they deserve a higher wage. And this will be an equilibrium in the sense that high ability workers maximize the utility by getting an education because they will get paid more. And low ability workers do not get an education. It is optimal for them because it is too costly. The firm can distinguish types apart and it will propose a different wage depending on the education level of the applicant. Hence the name separating equilibrium. Now, I mentioned two types of equilibria. You can already guess that if there is a separating one, there must be a non-separating one. We call this a pooling equilibrium, where everybody is put in the same pool. If it is not too costly for low ability workers to get education, then both types of workers might want to get education. And careful here, because I said might. 
if everybody gets education, employers cannot tell types apart and will not propose a higher wage. Everybody has, a, has the same degree, so the employer doesn't know who is a high ability worker and who is a low ability worker. So education will not help workers get a better wage because the firm is going to propose the same wage to everybody. But then wait a minute. If education doesn't help get a better wage, why get education here? After all, we assume that education does not improve anybody. It does not turn a low ability worker into a high ability one. So if education does not help workers get a better wage, why would they get a better wage? Oh, sorry, why would they, get, would they get an education? So in this case, education will not serve as a signal for ability. In fact, education will be useless. Nobody is going to get education. If it is to get the same wage as somebody who doesn't get education, why get an education here? And so we have a pooling equilibrium. In the separating equilibrium, the signal is working because it is too costly to fake. A low ability worker doesn't want to get an education because it is too hard, too costly. And this is why high ability workers want to get an education. For them, it's not too costly, but seeing that it is too costly for the low ability workers, then they decide to get it because they can use it to distinguish themselves. In the pooling equilibrium, since anybody could get an education, it's not too costly for anybody, then workers will not be able to distinguish themselves. They will get paid the same. So why pay tuition fees and why, why study for so many years if the wage will be the same no matter what? So nobody will get education in the pooling equilibrium case. Any questions? So, individuals who hold relevant private information can sometimes use signals to convey this information. The signal only works if sending the same signal is too costly for other individuals. Otherwise, there is no point, the signal is useless. It doesn't help you distinguish yourself. The signal is costly to acquire and only helps convey information. That's another very important point. So sending the signal will be inefficient here. It will be in the best interest of a high ability one to get education if it's a separating equilibrium, but it is still inefficient in the sense that literally a high ability worker is buying his degree, is literally buying a line on the resume. It is inefficient because it is a wasteful use of resources. If only the employer knew who was a low ability worker and who was a high ability worker, there would be no need for education. And there are many other examples of socially wasteful signaling. So education on labor markets, but education in the broader sense, there could be training, there could be internships, co-ops or uh, skills that you acquire, like languages, and so on and so forth. It is not necessarily wasteful in the case of education because education in real life does increase productivity. My ability is way higher since I got my degrees 
than before I got them. So education made me a more productive person. So we could make the same model and say, well, if they get education, low ability workers become high ability workers because now they have the skills, they're trained. On product markets, warranties can be used as a signal. A warranty is a way for firms to tell customers that their good is going to, is going to last or it's a good quality product for at least six months, one year, two years, whatever the duration of the warranty. Why is that a signal? Because if the product was actually a bad quality product, customers would come back to the store and ask for a replacement. They would use the warranty and the, and the firm would go bankrupt. So if a firm puts a warranty on a product, it is confident that the product will not break down at least before the end of the warranty period. In fact, some products have a lifetime warranty. As in, if you break something on, if you break something 20 years from now, you can return it to the store and they can replace it or they give you a credit or whatever the warranty is, um, is saying. In fact, I know one uh, backpack brand that, is, uh, that has lifetime warranties on its products. And of course, it's a warranty on a certain amount of um, damages. Um, but there are also other technical equipments. Uh, I'm thinking about some outdoor gear that has lifetime warranties. Advertisement can also be used as a way to signal the quality of your product. I mentioned the example of Nike before. The advertising in itself doesn't give you any extra information. So it's a way to say, yeah, Nike is here. They are powerful. They are confident that they are going to sell. There are, of course, other forms of advertising. The first one being informative advertising, as in commercials or advertisements are actually giving true information, like descriptive information about a product. Sometimes you see this with cars, where they give you a bunch of features. Then there is persuasive advertising, which is more about appealing to the customer, but not so much offering information about the quality of the good. For instance, George Clooney doing uh, commercials for Nespresso. He doesn't say anything about the quality of the coffee. But because George Clooney is drinking it, it looks like it's a, it's a better quality product. And the last form of advertising is, of course, advertising as a signal like Nike's billboard on the highway. On financial markets, the debt equity ratio can be used as a signal of the um, risk associated to a firm. Firms can uh, fund their capital using either debt, getting a loan from the bank, or by um, selling stocks to private agents and um, institutions. The ratio of debt to equity can be used, uh, is often used as a, a measure of performance or a measure of risk on financial markets. In legal disputes, there is a thing called pre-trial settlement demands. Let me give you an example of what it is. Imagine I buy some food from Safeway and I get poisoned. Like I'm in bed for one or two days, I'm uh, vomiting, it's uh, terrible, maybe the food was just bad, but the expiration date maybe was not mentioned or maybe it was, it was uh, dating one week. And I decide to sue Safeway for selling something that is expired for this long because it's actually um, not allowed. The trial happens in six months. Okay, I hire a lawyer, Safeway hires a lawyer, and um, there is a rendezvous, there is an appointment at the court in six months. 
Safeway could also contact me before the trial and ask me to drop the charges and say, hey, let's not go to court. Let's settle this right now and might propose some sort of compensation for me to drop my charges. If this is the case, I can imagine that maybe conclude that hmm, Safeway maybe is a bit shaky. They are not very confident about this case. They might lose it and they might end up paying more damages. So they can contact me before hoping I will not go all the way to, to, the, um, to the court. So they might propose me money or others for other form of compensation for me to drop the charges. That can be used as leverage. If Safeway contacts me and says, okay, we propose you $5,000 if you just drop the charges and we don't go to court, I could say, hmm, you guys are not very confident. Maybe I can raise the bar and I can obtain $10,000 or $20,000 for a pre-trial settlement. In bargaining, rejecting an offer or delaying your response could be also uh, used as a signal. If somebody takes two, three days to, or maybe a week, I don't know, if somebody takes some delay uh, to respond to your offer, maybe it's, a way to sh maybe it's a way to signal that this person is actually hesitating and that you do not need to propose a very, um, very high price or way higher price in order to make the deal. Live entertainment and restaurants, concerts, live performances, movie theaters, lineups, and sold out tickets can be seen as a signal of the quality of the performance or the restaurant. When you see restaurants with lineups of like 30 minutes or more, and you see that other restaurants nearby don't have such a lineup, that might signal that that restaurant is worth winning in line 30 minutes for. So that might say something about the quality of the food. When tickets are sold out within an hour after being released for a concert or a movie, that might say a lot about the performance, the quality of the performance to come. Marriage and dating also has some um, signaling in it. Fancy car, presents can be used as signals of affection or as a way to say, well, I can provide for you. I can um, help you financially. I'm here. Presents can be a sign of affection. But even at earlier stages of the relationship, texting delays are some sort of a signal. You are probably aware of this whole uh, kind of seduction strategic game where you do not answer texts right away. Maybe you wait for a day or half a day to look like you're detached or to look like you do not care too much and so on and so forth. There are many relationships that start with both sides of the relationship playing this kind of strategic games. Um, to send some signals to the other party in order to obtain what they want. To each their own. But there are many, many other examples. That's it for this lecture on adverse selection and signaling. Have a good rest of your week and see you in the next one. Bye.